What is up guys? In this series, we are talking about the Kalman filter and this video is particularly about the base filter. If you're new to this video series, we started with the intuitive understanding of what a Kalman filter is. In the second video, we move to the alpha beta filter, which forms the basis of a Kalman filter. In this video, we are talking about the base filter, which with some assumptions becomes a Kalman filter, but we'll talk about that in a bit. In the next video, we will formally introduce the Kalman filter. And in the video after that, we will have practical examples of building a Kalman filter from scratch in Python. So let's get started with the base filter in this video. If we were to summarize what we've done up until now in this series, we started with the idea of a Kalman filter in an intuitive fashion. The Kalman filter is a tool that helps you estimate a state based on an internal mathematical model of how the state should evolve and sensor measurements from any sensor values. We combine these two values to get a better estimate of the state at every time step. Making this slightly more formal, a Kalman filter has two steps, state predict and state update. In state predict, what we do is we take the value of the estimate at time t minus one and using an internal mathematical model, we find out what the value according to math should be at time instance t. And in state predict, we use the estimate we got from the previous step from predict and fuse it with the sensor measurement values at time t to get a better value of the estimate at time t. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, please check the previous videos in this series. You should start with part one. And then part two is about understanding what an alpha beta filter is. We made a numerical example as well to actually exhibit uh, an alpha beta filter in action. I hope you know what I'm talking about here because we've covered these two in the previous two videos. Now let's move on to the base filter. But why the base filter when understanding the Kalman filter? That's a valid question, right? Well, I will give you an answer to that towards the end of this video. But for now, just understand that the base filter is the base on which we develop a Kalman filter. To understand the base filter, as usual, we will not take the jargony and definition based approach, but understand it using an example. Now let's bring forward the example we know, which is about an autonomous car moving in a straight line. And we will understand how to build a base filter from scratch using math and our example alone. Let's start. Before we jump into the core of this video, this video is sponsored by no one, unfortunately, but this video is brought to you by Matthias and I. Matthias and I are collaborating on this series for Kalman Filter and of course, a lot more to come. And if you want to check out his profile or my profile, we have all the links in the description of this video. Okay, so now we go into the base filter, but instead of throwing jargons at you, of course, we will do this in an example based fashion where we will first actually derive the base filter using an example. So we start with the example, introduce everything, introduce all equations we need and literally derive the base filter. In the previous video about alpha beta filters, we presented an example of an autonomous car that needs localization or tracking in time. The car moved in a straight line with the assumption of constant velocity. And for every timestamp, we estimated how far the car is based on the constant velocity assumption and the measurement values from the antenna, right? To formalize that, let's now assign variables to different values. If you haven't seen the previous video, it might be a good idea to watch it, but I will just give a refresher on this example. In this example, you have this car and it is moving in a straight line with the assumption of constant velocity. Here you have an antenna that measures the distance for every time step. Now here, what are the variables we have? The first variable is Z and that is your sensor observation or antenna measurements. This tells you where your car is, but of course, like any sensor, this sensor is also prone to noise. The second variable is U, which is your control data. In our case, this is a constant velocity model. So what we are saying is our control data that leads to the change in the state, which is the position of the car is velocity. You give velocity to the car and the position changes. So that is how you're controlling the state, right? The third variable is X, which is the state of the system. And in this case, it is basically the position of the car or distance of the car from the origin, which happens to be the antenna here. So the antenna is at your point of origin. So we have sensor observation Z, control data U and state of the system X. These variables are well defined in our example, but they can vary based on the problem statement and approach. For instance, the state of the system can be the position of the robot in the environment or the position of a landmark in the world. That is anything that you want to estimate. Something to note here is that in many examples, you will see that the system state includes both position and velocity of a mobile robot. 
in that case control data u can be let's say acceleration so in our system in our example if we say that our system state includes both position and velocity u will be zero because then we'll say u is acceleration and the assumption of constant velocity of course says that you have no acceleration at all but even if you don't do that and you say that your system state is only position and velocity is a part of your control data you will arrive at the same results we'll still have the same model behavior so don't worry about it if this doesn't make sense just follow along in the series for now because in the later videos when we will do all of this in python you will understand what i'm saying here now we have these variables z u and x it is now time to explain how these variables are related to each other in the world of probability. Since we know the sensor observation Z and the control data U, only the state of the system X is unknown. And that is our problem statement essentially, right? We want to understand the value of X at every time instance because X denotes the position of the car and that's all we want to know or that's all we want to estimate. So we ask ourselves, what is the state of the system, that is X, given the sensor observation Z and the control data u. You get z and you have your control data u for every time instance and you want to understand the value of x for that time instance. Mathematically speaking, this equation is equivalent to this probability of x given z and u. I think I should either say z or z because I use them interchangeably but let's be okay with z for now. Another way of looking at this equation is how likely is the state of the system to be x given z and u right these are different ways of looking at the same equation this probability can be uniform distribution and as we acquire more observation and execute actions we get more certain about the state it could be any distribution for now we are not talking about what distribution this has right now in the end we hopefully get a peak distribution around one state and we also hope that it is correct Speaking of that, we can never say that the value of the system state is exactly something because we have a probability distribution here and it is never 100% certain. This equation estimates the state of the system after observation and control data as I said and that's why it's called the posterior. To estimate such a posterior, we use the Bayes rule in conjunction with other rules in probability. So in this derivation, in the next couple of minutes, we will start with this equation that is probability of x given z and u. That is our task to understand the value of the state. And we will derive everything using Bayes rule and some other probability uh, techniques. And in the end, we will come up with a recursive equation that allows us to integrate sensor observation and control data one step at a time to recursively estimate the state of the system. If you've seen what we did with alpha beta filters, you will get a sense of what I'm trying to do here. If not, please look at that video. So we start with the following equation. Belief of x of t is equal to probability of x of t given z1 until t and u1 until t. Now we also have your time included here, right? It is exactly the previous equation except for the fact that we introduced the concept of time. In simple terms, it says what is my belief about the current state that is x at time instance t given the set of all observations that is z1 until t and the set of all controls that is u1 until t because right now we are at time instance t so everything from the past for z and u is used to estimate t so this is what we want to solve considering all the data up until now and including time instance t what is the state of the system this is our basic question we can apply the first rule here to start this derivation this rule is called Bayes rule but let's also understand what Bayes rule is to do that, let's consider the probability of two different events happening. That would be probability of A intersection B and that is where both the events are happening. In probability, you can say that probability of A intersection B is equal to probability of A into probability of B given A. I'm sure you know about this already. If not, please check it out separately. This is basic probability. However, the probability of A and B is also equal to the probability of B times probability of A given B. So the right hand side of both these equations are the same, right? So if we continue from that, this is what we have. We have probability of A given B is equal to probability of A into probability of B given A divided by probability of B. This is actually your Bayes rule. The Bayes rule describes the probability of an event A based on prior knowledge of conditions B that might be related to A. 
Also, probability of B in the denominator is actually a normalizing factor in your base rule to make sure that the overall probability is between 0 and 1. So, we can say that probability of A given B is equal to normalizer, which is actually probability of B inverse into probability of B given A into probability of A. This makes sense, right? Now that we understand what the base rule is, let's go back to our main equation and use this to further derive our belief of x for time instance t. Using this Bayes rule, you can say that belief of x for time instance t is equal to normalizer into probability of z t given x t z 1 until t minus 1 u 1 until t into probability of x t z 1 until t minus 1 and u 1 until t. We do that because we are taking zt as b and everything else as a. Spend some time looking at this if this doesn't make sense. Look at the blog because the entire video also has a blog version where you can understand what's happening. We just swapped xt and zt which is equal to probability of b given a and left the rest of the sensor observation sequence on the right side and that was z1 until t minus 1. This is your basic base rule at play. Now we can simplify the first part of this equation based on Markov assumption. It assumes that if a conditional probability distribution of future states depends only on present data to estimate this future states and not the past data, then past data is unnecessary, right? For example, if you are at some point, if you're standing at some point and you take two steps forward, it doesn't matter how you came to that point before you started moving further, right? So we can simplify this further to this. We do not need z1 until t minus 1 and also u1 until t because you have your measurement. How the robot moved for time instance t doesn't matter because you have your measurement already. All that matters for the measurement is where your robot is. The value of your measurement depends on where your robot is. The robot has already moved based on u of t to point xt. So xt has so to speak, encoded all information for time instance t when it comes to understanding the probability of z of t. Now, this was simplifying the first part of the equation. The second part of the equation can also be solved. We first have to understand what it means. We want to estimate the current state of the system x of t based on all sensor observations except the last one and all control data, right? So for this estimation, we need to use the law of total probability. If you don't know what it means, I will show you the equation, but you can check it out separately as well. It basically tells you how to compute the total probability of an outcome through multiple events happening at the same time. Its integral version is this probability of X is equal to probability of X given Y into probability of Y over all possible values of Y. If you want to apply this to the second part of the equation, we can say that X in this case is X of T and y is x of t minus 1 and everything else that's z and u they are already happening so they will be on the right side within the probability so this is what your equation will start looking like now by applying the markov assumption to the first term of the integral again we can simplify this equation further right because x of t will not depend on past values so it doesn't matter what happened with z and u in the past that means z is eliminated and u of 1 until t minus 1 is also eliminated so this is what your equation now becomes. Continuing the simplification, the second term of the integral can also be simplified. If you're trying to estimate the state of the system for timestamp t minus one, all data for time t is irrelevant, right? Because that is the future for time t minus one. So we can remove u of t. So that means your equation simplifies to this. Now, after so much work, you actually end up with this long equation. But do you actually see a pattern here? Do you see what this term means? We started with this equation, right? And what we see is exactly the same equation, but your index is changing from x of t to x of t minus 1. This basically is belief of x of t minus 1. So it is just the solution we want for the previous time step. So we can say that belief of x of t is actually this. Finally, we have a recursive update scheme because you are looking at your solution from the previous time step, which is the estimate of x of t minus one and using it for getting your current estimate, which is x of t. This recursive approach allows us to estimate the state of the system based on the previous state, 
the control data for the current motion and the current sensor observation. So you see that you really don't have to maintain a history of everything that has happened in the past because that is encoded in this recursive update scheme already. Now we have a recursive update equation. So you, we can say that this is a solution, but let's understand the solution. We can actually split this to understand different parts of this equation itself. We are going to split it into two steps, prediction and update. And now if you've seen the previous video, do you understand how this is relating to the alpha beta filter? In your alpha beta filter, you also had two steps, prediction and update. And now what you see is you will still have prediction and update steps. It's just that now it makes a lot more sense mathematically because we are deriving them instead of just saying this is what it is. So we will show that this equation has a mathematical representation of both your predict step and your update step. We only had a conceptual grasp on them until the previous video. And now let's make it more formal. This part of the equation is your prediction step. It takes into account the belief about the previous state and the control data, which is the action to take the system from the previous state to the current one. And this leads to the estimate of predicted belief, not the final estimated belief, right? Basically it predicts what the state will be based on previous estimate and the control data. And this is something we also saw in our alpha beta filter example. And the other part of the equation is your update step. What's happening is you already are done with your predict step and that leads to belief with a hat of X of T. And now you are fusing this with the values you got from your sensor. So your sensor estimate and your prediction are fused here. This equation relies on the predicted belief and the sensor observation, of course, and we estimate the current updated belief. And that is also your final estimate of the state for this time instance. This normalizing factor helps to maintain the outcome of the integral so that it is always between zero and one because we are working in the world of probability. But there is more to these equations. In the prediction step, we are dealing only with the control data and the previous state of the system. The control data has to be modeled and for that we use the motion model. This is based on the internal mathematical model you have about the state. In our example, if we assume constant velocity, u of t would basically have your velocity, which will be constant. And you have x of t, you have the velocity, you have x of t minus one. So using simple laws of motion, you can get the value of x of t. This is a simplified example, of course, but with probability, you will get a probability distribution using this equation itself. The same applies to the update step, but to the sensor observation. If we can update the state of the system with the sensor observation model properly, we can correct the prediction. So that is your update step. So this is your observation model. This means we now have a mathematical representation of both our predict and update steps. By the way, this equation put together with your prediction step and your update step here is called your base filter. This makes a lot more sense, right? I did not introduce the base filter with boring heavy definitions initially, but we literally built a base filter using what? Using a problem statement, which was belief of X of T, base rule and some more ideas in probability. That's always better than throwing random jargon at you, right? So essentially base filter can be written as a two step process. That's for predict and update. This actually concludes our presentation for the base filter, which is a recursive state estimation technique based on base rule and probability. It is a general framework that uses two models, motion and observation to estimate the value of the state. You can have more than one things in the state. Of course, as I said before, you can just have position, you can have position and velocity. You can have the position of the robot, position of different landmarks, velocity of the robot. It actually depends on how you model your problem statement as well. And you will have a simpler example towards the end of the series in Python as well. And now do you also see how this is conceptually like an alpha beta filter in your alpha beta filter, you were also using prediction and update steps as I showed you before in the previous video. And this is exactly what you're doing now. But for an alpha beta filter, you had to fix your alpha and beta values. The equation I showed you also has those alpha beta values, so to speak, encoded in them. But unlike the alpha beta filter, we will not hard code these values. When we introduce the Kalman filter, it'll compute these alpha beta values, so to speak, for every iteration. But let's not rush and we'll get into it soon. So you saw how to build a base filter from scratch using math and our example. Essentially, as I said before, a base filter has two steps, predict and update, which matches our idea from the previous video of alpha beta filters. But now a bigger question, why are we actually talking about the base filter? And why not just move to the Kalman filter? Well, as it turns out, 
The Kalman filter is a kind of base filter. Kalman filter is actually equal to base filter plus two assumptions. The first assumption is that all distributions are Gaussian and the second assumption is that all models, so your observation model and your motion model are linear dynamic models. So you have the assumption of linearity in those models. If you have those two assumptions, then you can say that your base filter plus those two assumptions is equal to the Kalman filter. This is very advantageous because base filter without this assumption would lead to very complicated math. The base filter estimates the posterior probability given the prior probability and your sensor measurements. But without these assumptions, the computation for finding this full posterior is very complicated. As soon as you add those assumptions, your math solves all of this and your Kalman filter, which is base filter plus the two assumptions I'm talking about, builds a recursive approach in a fashion that you don't really have to do a lot of complex mathematical computation. We will see what I'm talking about right now in the next video when we formally introduce the Kalman filter with all the equations. So the idea is Kalman filter is base filter plus the two assumptions I'm talking about. This is the crux of this video. Now let's also summarize what we've learned so far in this series and also in this video. In the first video, we tried to understand what our problem statement is. Using an example of an autonomous car, we showed in the first video that estimating the state, which is the position of the car, is not straightforward if we just use the internal mathematical model of the state or we just use sensor measurements because both of these ways by themselves are not really accurate. But when we combine the both of them, we get a really good value or at least a much better value than before. This was the first video and we built an intuitive understanding of that. In part two of the series, we went to the alpha beta filter, which forms the basis of the Kalman filter we are talking about now and we'll talk about in the next videos. And in this video, we were talking about the base filter. And if you add two assumptions to that, which I already talked about, you get your Kalman filter. We understood the basic equations of the base filter. And now in the next video, we will go to the Kalman filter. And finally, after all this jazz, we will introduce the formal equations so that you understand the Kalman filter. But through the series, you actually built a Kalman filter instead of directly looking at the equations. So I hope this video helped you and I will see you in the next video. I'd love to know what you think about this one. Bye-bye.